First, let me thank Rada for igniting our conversation. We're going to have a lot of these play on words today. But that was exciting to hear uh, the vision for going forward and uh, gives us a lot to work from up here. I'm joined by two members of the Global Alliance's Leadership Council. They were just identified to you. But I just want to say a word about each because they have been such great champions. Administer McCarthy has a deep understanding of the issue. But even more importantly, she has an incredible passion for it and has been a superb champion. No matter where we are or what the topic is, she manages to work the issue of clean cooking into the conversation at all times. So you're going to love to hear her enthusiasm and passion today. She and EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States, have really been instrumental in leading our government's uh, role in championing this issue. So Gina, thank you very much. Minister Tete has also been an incredible voice and advocate for cook stoves, not only in Ghana, but throughout, throughout West Africa and all of Africa. Through leading her role in the, in the uh, government of Ghana, she's really shown us what governments can do to make a difference. And we're going to hear a lot more about that today. But I just want to say thank you. You are the reason we have such confidence in moving forward for the second second phase of the Cook Stove Alliance. So I'm going to ask each of them to give some brief opening remarks, and then we're going to engage in a short conversation. So Minister Tatek, could I ask you to go first? Thank you very much, Kathy. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here with you in my capacity as a member of the Leadership Council, but also because I think this is a very important issue. Sometimes when we think about the very simple act of cooking, we assume that it's just a process of making sure that we can have the meals that we like and we enjoy on the table and the way we feed our families. But in some parts of the world, especially where I come from, in Ghana, in Africa, and I would say across the continent as a whole, the way we go about our cooking also affects the way in which we live our lives and the impact on our environment and on our economies. At our last population and housing census in 2010, it was, this, it was found as a fact that 73% of our population still uses solid fuels for cooking. That translates into wood and charcoal. What that also means is that we are having significant environmental impacts because of deforestation, because people are using wood and charcoal to do their cooking. And in the Western world, you have many more efficient ways of doing that at the moment. It also impacts on the lives of rural women who have to walk very long distances to carry that firewood on their heads or on their backs before they finally get home. And then they, it takes them about 30 minutes to light the fire and then they're cooking. And with the inhalation of smoke and with the amount of damage it does, it's not surprising that a lot of them have respiratory tract infections. And when you hear them speaking, it even has an impact on their voices. And so dealing with this issue, and bringing solutions that will allow for clean, efficient cooking is important, not just because it's more efficient, but because for us it's environmentally more sustainable. And eventually, if we are able to deal with the challenge, it's good for the rest of the world as well. So it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. And I hope that you are all sufficiently inspired at the end of this event. And we'll be also doing your bit to support this event a lot more. Thank you. Uh, first of all, um, good morning. Uh, we are going to have a great couple of days. I'm excited to be here. I want to thank Kathy for all of her leadership and certainly Rada for having made the Alliance into a formidable organization that's going to be able to move us forward um, as we face this tremendous challenge. And I want to thank Connor and others who have made the travel here. Uh, because I think it speaks volumes about the challenge that we're facing and our need to face it. Um, I started to get active in this issue back in 2009 when President Obama appointed me in charge of the US EPA's air office. Now, I struggled uh, in that position uh, to try to explain the challenge of air pollution in this country. Um, and I realized that what I had missed was that this country is benefiting from tremendous uh, cleaner air than in most countries. And when I was first introduced to the work that EPA was doing on cook stoves, 
Um, I looked at those numbers and I realized that they were orders of magnitude larger than what we were, were actually proposing to go to because we saw the health consequences associated with our numbers, never mind the pollution levels that women and children, primarily women and children, are being exposed to in other countries. And you know, the simple truth of the matter is if you're a caring human being, once you're informed, you have to get engaged. How do you stand on the sidelines? You have three billion people who are using these cook stoves that are exposed to the, to the fumes, to the pollution, that, are le that is leading to so many deaths. Four million human beings. Their lives are cut short, most of them children. So once I got engaged, I realized that, we, that there were other women in the administration who would actually like to know about this. So I told my boss, Lisa Jackson, she was equally outraged. She went and called Hillary Clinton, who couldn't believe it. Okay, and, and it went on and on and on. So that, that 15 months after those initial discussions, we had the alliance up and running because we had great people like Kathy and Rada came on board to be able to mount this kind of attack because it is an attack. And, and the last issue I would like to point out before we go to a more casual conversation is that one, one of uh, uh, sort of the, the most prominent women in U.S. government um, has been Madeleine Albright, uh, who many of you may remember was the Secretary of State. And Madeleine Albright said something that has always stuck with me. She said that there is a special place in hell for women who don't help women. I am here because I want that to be the loneliest place ever, and I never want to see it. If you join me, you won't have to see it too. Thanks. I told you you'd love this one. So I want to ask both of you, um, you're, both, of, both governments have a lot of issues on the agenda to deal with, to prioritize, to fund. How do you take this issue forward? I mean, it's clear, Gina, you did it by sheer force of will and, and educating people, first of all. And, and Hannah, you've actually shown people what's going on in your country. But how do you, in terms of the government support, make the case? How do you link it to all the other issues? What, what hurdles have you both had to overcome to move this issue forward? Well, to be quite honest, the government of Ghana has been quite forward-looking on this matter, which is good, because it hasn't, you haven't had to make so much effort to explain the issue, because we see it clearly, what the implications are. As far back as 1993, our University of Science and Technology developed a new cook stove. It was called the Ahibenso cook stove, which was more energy efficient, which used less um, wood fuel, and which was cleaner in, in its use. But it was a prototype. They were able to do about 400,000 uh, cook stoves. And so some people benefited, some did not. Later on, when we became much more concerned about the impacts of deforestation, and the impact that was having on our climate. We engaged in a campaign to get more people to use LPG and gas stoves instead of um, using charcoal. But that was not sustainable because at that time we didn't have our own sources of gas. And um, once people found out that you could also use gas for, to, to power motor vehicles, there was a competition for the supplies of gas that were being imported between um, commercial vehicle drivers who then converted their cars to um, gas usage instead of using um, petrol and people who were going to use it for cooking. But we launched a program in 2012, which was the Sustainable Energy for All program, where we want to move the usage of LPG from about 18% of our population to 50% of our population. And that is entirely possible because now we have our own gas resources, the gas pipeline that we are constructing will hopefully become operational early next year, sometime in January. And so it's about rolling out the distribution mechanisms to make sure that across the length and breadth of our country, people can use gas. But even before that is, is carried into effect, we also want to have a situation where 
the cook stoves that were developed that use the existing solid fuels, so solid sources of, of energy, sorry, to fuel the cook stoves, also become more efficient in their energy usage because for a while that will be the way people still cook their meals. And so it's a process of making, especially in the rural areas, people aware of the impact of their actions on the rainfall in their communities, on the reasons why the seasons are changing and why we don't see the same kind of seasonal patterns we used to have before. And of course, for the women to find a way of letting them understand that this is actually the reason why both yourself and your child are having much more um, respiratory tract infections and how it could be much better for you if you would use a more efficient form of cooking. So it's, it's really an issue of creating the awareness. When you have a population that is about 50% rural and therefore has to catch up in terms of their knowledge, you can, once you explain this to them and they understand it from a common sense perspective, it's possible to move forward with it. So the government is engaged in making sure that we explain, we educate, we make available the alternatives so that people can change the way that they do this. And at least it's, it's very heartening to be part of a process where the buy-in is there. And so you're not pushing up a wall. Now, that's about Ghana, but on a regional level as well, because this is not just a Ghanaian problem, it's an African problem. The thing is to make many more people aware of the challenge, what it involves, why we should all be working at it in a more coherent matter, because in a more coherent manner, because you can't just have a country taking those particular initiatives. It has to be across our region, across our continent, to really make a difference. And that's the next step that we have to engage in with a little more effort. Thank you. And I'm glad you mentioned sustainable energy for all, because that is a, a framework for a lot of this work to, to fall within. This is the Secretary General's initiative by 2030 to provide universal access to clean energy doubling the use of renewables and doubling our efficiency use of energy. So thank you, that, that's a good context for us. Gina? Well, I think that it, it certainly didn't help to have Hillary Clinton leading the charge um, in the US. But honestly, uh, the, the issue of, of cook stoves is so multidimensional. You know, there are so many issues that, that this particular initiative can move forward. You know, there's health issues, there's social issues, there's climate issues associated with this. So the great thing about this was when, when we pulled all the agencies together, we realized, first of all, that people were compelled by the need. Um, it mattered. Um, we were all a bunch of federal bureaucrats who struggle to make a difference in people's lives and hope you can by the time you leave office. This was one that all of us said, wow, we can make a difference now. We want it. We want to feel good about what we do. You know, and, and the second issue was that when you looked around the room, we had incredible capacity. And, and then the third thing was that we realized that if we move this forward, it was exactly the kind of priority that each of those, each of those agencies themselves should be doing. So I didn't have to convince NIH that coming to the table with significant research on an issue that is as large as this and needs so much work associated with it was a good thing. That's what they do for a living. You know, I didn't need to ask the CDC to go out and do field evaluations to see how good we, we're doing in the field. They wanted to do it. They're there anyways. I had the Peace Corps. People were knocking on our door to find out how to be part of it, not being kept out of it. DOE wanted to do research on these technologies. EPA had already set up uh, an, an opportunity for us to be de building partnerships in looking at these stoves. But for an agency that, frankly, is struggling with its budget, we, our folks jumped on it. They built an entire new lab so that we could test the stoves, work on, on building ISO guidelines, making this a surer market so private sector investment would follow. And it just went on and on and on. And I think once you recognize that this is so multidimensional, and as Hillary Clinton so brilliantly understood, it was her entree for discussions with countries that were struggling that was the most positive, productive way to understand how those cultures are operating and how the US could go in and to support what they need. Um, and it's been uh, an incredible journey 
What we struggled with at th that point in time, though, was how do you systemically and strategically get this moving? How do you recognize that you have a big challenge, that, there's a, that you have to get to what the, the WHO guidelines have most recently told us, but that you're not going to make one big leap you need to be strategic about how to build this, how to get the momentum. And I think, frankly, there are more people in the world today that understand the impact of this problem than ever understood it back in 2009. Um, and more people are engaged, and I think the Alliance has a great deal to do with that. And I think they're providing that strategic and systemic opportunity to make progress moving forward while we look at building the infrastructure for, you know, reaching the kind of targets from a health perspective that we need to achieve. Well, that's great. You know, the issue of, like, that cuts across so many areas, health, women's security and empowerment, climate, is a challenge for governments because it forces breaking down some silos. And so it's clear both of you have had some success doing that. Gina, you mentioned clearing the way for the private sector to come to the table and Rada laid out that this is a new model of, of pr public funds leveraging private sector funding. What are governments and can governments do to ensure that the private sector has a place and a very valuable place in helping move this market forward? Do you want to take that, Gina, first? Yeah, let me, uh, let me hit that issue. I think one of the things I've learned at EPA is that e EPA is uh, a very much a public health agency. We use the Clean Air Act to advance public health. We set rules that level the playing field and try to understand how we can achieve those goals. And what I realized is we don't do rules to do rules, we do rules to, to move markets. That's why we do them. And so one of the greatest values that I could think we can bring more broadly to the table in terms of getting private sector funding on board is to basically set those rules. To look at, to do testing, to set not just guidelines but standards at ISO to make it a level playing field so that we can be assured that when people are investing in this, you are investing in a solid market where you know what your piece of the action could be. Uh, we understood that there were US companies and companies abroad that were building these stoves. Nobody was comparing them. Nobody understood what was best. Nobody understood what would, could be culturally appropriate in different areas to be able to allow women to produce the food that was culturally acceptable. To, to themselves and that their kids would eat. That's always the challenge everywhere, I would suggest. And so we, we, have to, we had to be sensitive to that. So we can actually provide a lot of certainty to the market. And that's some of the things we're trying to do so that private sector has an opportunity. But I think in, in we also see you know, opportunities for new financing strategies. They have to be there. And so we have OPIC and USAID that have come to the table looking at new financing mechanisms so that we can develop a variety of those that are most appropriate for the area that we're looking at and for what the challenge is in individual countries as well as communities. And if you can get those financing mechanisms up and running, and I think you'll be pretty excited about some of the announcements tomorrow. Uh, because we, I think we are trying to kick it into action. And I couldn't be more proud of all of the leadership that I've seen step up to this issue. So it's getting a market going. It's greasing the skids with government dollars. It's recognizing that government dollars or public dollars aren't going to get you all the way there. But they can make a robust market available that will then have the wherewithal to grow. And that's the challenge that we're facing. And I think we're stepping up to it. I agree very much on the issue of regulation. I mean, it's something that we are addressing as well because it's important to have standardization, especially with the development of these cook stoves. Again, so that there's the incentive for the private sector to get involved and to feel that there is going to be a market and not going to be undercut by cheaper, less efficient models that perhaps don't um, achieve the objectives that you've set. The challenge we have from an African perspective is that our governments are less in a position to be able to put the kind of financing behind these initiatives than you are in a position to do so in the, in the Western world. And usually when I say this, you know, people, are, people look at me and say, isn't government's job to collect tax revenue and deploy that tax revenue effectively? When you have, as in our case, very large informal sectors, 
being able to generate that kind of tax revenue is in and of itself an issue. But using the vehicle of regulation to provide the structure that allows the private sector to participate is important. What we also are seeking to do in our program going forward is to invite private sector businesses that would like to be engaged with us as part of their corporate social responsibility activities to work with the government to see how we can roll this out because their businesses are also involved with food products and therefore there's a rationale for them to get behind this and to work with us to see how they can make the, the cleaner cooking facilities much more available. But we also think that it's important for the energy companies also to work with us to help to provide essentially the fifth fuel, help us with the supply of gas, help us with being able to invest in more in the exploitation of more of our gas resources, because that will then give us the opportunity to increase the rollout of LPG within our country as opposed to dealing with the solid fuels. Across, and, and Ghana is about four degrees um, higher than the zero meridian, so we're very near to the equator. And all the environmental issues that exist in our part of the world, especially with regard to deforestation, loss of rainforest cover, are things that are very pertinent in our space. So we're not just looking at it from the perspective of this is important to make cooking more efficient. This is important to make sure that our countries don't become more and more dry. And we don't find desertification creeping up, you know, more and more because the impact of that is going to be horrible in and of itself. So on a multiple level of fronts, we think that we have enough policy reasons and regulatory frameworks and are ready to develop further regulation that helps to unlock more private sector interests. Because you can do regulation and become a whole, you know, an, an agency where it's impossible to do anything because you have people having to move from one office to the other and things basically don't seem to roll out at all. Or you can introduce regulation in such a way that it is an incentive to get the private sector to participate. And we're looking at, for, at it from the perspective of developing regulation that provides the incentives for the private sector to participate. And also providing some government funding to leverage private sector funding within the limited resource envelope that we have, because we think it's important enough of an issue to do that. So you're making such a good point about uh, the role of government bringing in the private sector because that's one of the ways we're going to get to scale. Seems to me the other way we're going to get to scale is empowering women. And there's so many ways that this industry can empower women, but it seems like that's going to also be a critical piece on this uh, path from poverty to prosperity that we hope we're taking over the next 15 years. How, do we, how does that gender issue play out in both of your thinking? Well, let me just kick it off by saying, you know, one of the major goals of the United States is to actually empower women and get them more active in participating in governments ac across the world. You know, we've certainly recognized that when that happens, it doesn't just bring stability to families, it actually brings stability to governments, because you men are way too volatile. You need, you need women, actually, telling you how to pace yourselves, you know? Um, but it, so it's a great opportunity, I think, in many ways for government to government relationships to, to actually advance. Um, and, and it also is about getting women actively involved in new markets that these stoves can produce. We are talking about opportunities for small businesses. We're talking about opportunities for women to get into the value chain of these cook stoves. I mean, these cook stoves don't last forever. They last for four or five years. There's opportunities to take a look at how, how, they, how you can, women can have businesses that they run that actually service. They're actually better at explaining why you should use it and how you use it and demonstrating that it works. They can get into to businesses that service and businesses that replace. There, this is just an opportunity not just to make sure that, that women don't have to face the choice of either feeding their children or keeping them healthy. That's, you can't do that. No woman should have to face the fact that she is hurting her child while she's trying to feed her family. How can that be? And so I think there are opportunities not just for women to really get engaged in, in, 
in terms of, of actively using these stoves, but there's an opportunity for economic growth to come out of this, and economic growth which also results in empowering women. That is where it needs to head, and I think there's every opportunity, if we do this well, to have it, to have it serve these multiple interests. Well, from our perspective, this doesn't just empower women economically, it also empowers them socially. When you have a situation where, as in our case, about half of our population is still involved in agriculture and smallholder agriculture, and a lot of the intermediate processing that takes place takes place with women, whether it is converting palm fruit into palm oil or converting groundnuts into groundnut paste or changing cassava into gari, which has better storage, all of this involves some part of the cooking process and involves women. So when you have a situation where they are able to do that more efficiently, they don't have to travel miles to go and get firewood, which is increasingly becoming more and more distant from their communities. When they are able to do this in an efficient manner, save time and save energy, it doesn't just help to make them economically viable, it changes the lives of their families. In countries where you have and in Africa, there's still a lot of polygamy. What happens is that invariably how far your children get depends on how much their mother is ready to invest in them. Mm -hmm. And so the greater empowerment of women actually has tangible benefits to their families, to their children. Because they are better placed to help them to go to school, even if they've never been to school themselves. They are better placed to be able to buy the things they need to be able to learn and to upgrade themselves. And when they need to go and progress further in their educational ladder, they have the resources to do so. They are able to build their own homes. They are able to take care of themselves in a much better way. And so you see it transforms them on several levels. I just want to mention something, a business that was started by a lady when I was, previously when I was Minister for Trade and Industry. And it's agro-processing, but it was soap making. And I remember the first time you know, one of my team, we had a rural enterprises program, got in touch with her. She was making her soap in her mud hut swish kitchen, which looked as if it was falling apart. And through this program, we gave her access to funding. We brought her the very simple equipment that she used for processing her soap, including better cooking equipment, because a lot of this was done on heat. Three years later, this lady has moved from a swish mud hut building to a cement building. She's able to standardize her product. She even exports her soap across the border because she lives in a community that is not far from our border, from Côte d'Ivoire. And of course, she's able to spend more on her family and her children. It has transformed her life. That is what a very simple thing, like having the right kind of cooking apparatus, can mean in terms of changing people's lives. And so, it's important because it allows the process of equalization to take place. It's not possible to talk about gender empowerment and gender equality when women essentially have to rely on males within their family to provide for their well-being. You know, you are on the receiving end. You get what you are given. But when you are able to earn money yourself, that makes a difference in your life. And having the right kind of cooking apparatus, moving away from what we've been doing, which is environmentally degrading, and being able to make that change in agricultural community, in rural communities, predominantly agricultural communities, where agro-processing value addition is done in this way, makes a world of difference. When you have more women like that empowered, your society changes. It's not about women like me, who have come from middle-class backgrounds, who have gone to secondary school and university and have choices. It's about making women at that level have choices as well. That's what brings change. Very inspiring. <laughs> so before I give both of our panelists the opportunity to make a 30-second call to action to all of you, I just, Gina's uh, quote by Madeleine Albright and, and Hannah's wonderful story reminded me of a very important quote by Eleanor Roosevelt. Women are like tea bags. You never know how strong they are until you put them in hot water. <laughs> so I think that's a lesson for our cooking today. So Hannah, would you like to give us a 30-second call to action for the next two days? 
Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, you're not here just to be in this lovely hotel. Neither were you here just to come and listen to us. I believe you're here because you also have a sense of purpose. And in helping to support this initiative, you are going to be able to do so much good, you can't even comprehend it at the moment, just how far reaching the impact would be. And so for those of you who are here as practitioners, as policymakers, as people who can support to fund some of these initiatives, I would encourage you to pay attention, to listen, to understand, but more importantly, after this is over, to support in every way you possibly can, to be able to create a situation where we are going to be able to change the lives of over 20 million, hopefully 30 million, even 40 million people would be great, by giving them the opportunity to have access to better cooking apparatus that is environmentally friendly, that helps to protect their health, that makes a difference in their lives, and delivers real change. It's a very simple thing. It's about cooking. Once we can work together to help to improve cooking, there's so much more that can happen as well. Thank you. It's, uh, I think, a little bit ironic that next week is Thanksgiving. Now, to those of you who are from the US, you will understand that that's a holiday where we all get together to basically celebrate the early years of uh, the US. And we eat a lot of turkey and take a nap. It's the best <laughs> holiday ever. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just want you to think about how lucky we are to be able to cook with our families in safety, uh, that we're able to uh, eat that together in comfort. And I want you to just think about how better you're going to feel next week um, if you really take the opportunity to share that wealth. Uh, I went to an event last week where I, we are ac actually we're trying to get food to be recovered because in the United States we waste 30% of our food. 30%. So I know you're here because you care. Um, you wouldn't be here otherwise. And I want to thank you for that level of commitment. And I think if you open up your minds to understand that, that this is not your uh, grandmother's program, this is today's program. This is built on our understanding of how you strategically do business and get it done. Um, I think if we bind together in partnership, we will all feel good about ourselves. When we take that nap, we'll be able to think happy thoughts at Thanksgiving. And uh, I just want to thank you for your willingness to consider and ask you to please do your best to open up not just your minds, but your, your pocketbooks as well. Uh, thank you very much for being here. <laughs>